Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the CEO at Loft Labs, Lucas Gentelli. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Lucas. Uh, I'm the CEO at Loft Labs, and uh, today we're going to talk. Uh, a little bit about how to improve your you know, Kubernetes cost, reduce your Kubernetes cost with uh, virtual clusters. To understand what virtual clusters are, you first need to understand what a Kubernetes cluster is. So essentially, a Kubernetes cluster has a control plane. That's the very fundamental part of it. This control plane typically has an API server. Uh, that you typically talk to, right? Every kubectl command, everything you do with Kubernetes goes through this uh, control plane to this API server. We also have typically a data store, uh, which is, you know, etcd that stores your uh, information. Uh, so everything, every container you store in Kubernetes, uh, every deployment service, everything, the entire state in Kubernetes is stored in this data store typically. We also have a controller manager and a scheduler. The controller manager typically replicates our containers to make sure we have you know, five replicas of a certain application. And then we also have the scheduler, which actually launches workloads inside the Kubernetes clusters to the different virtual machines. Then we have the workloads that run on top of this control plane. The workloads are usually hosted in so-called namespaces. So let's say um, we have a couple of pods inside here. Um, we have a couple of more namespaces with different applications. That's our actual applications running in different namespaces. Could be grouping by team, could be grouping by user. Um, that's essentially what these namespaces are for. What are virtual clusters now? You know, this is a regular Kubernetes cluster. How did we virtualize it? Well, at Loft Labs, we thought, why don't we just, um, instead of talking to this API server down here, what if we actually run another control plane inside a container, inside a namespace? That means our Kubernetes cluster is um, now running a control plane as a container, and this control plane has another API server. And a user can now just talk to this API server instead of talking to the real you know, EKS API server. Um, and that makes the virtual cluster virtual. If we're looking a little bit inside the virtual cluster, let's say we have a namespace in Kubernetes, a regular EKS cluster, and we have a namespace called host namespace. It's supposed to host our virtual cluster. Let's say we put a virtual Kubernetes cluster inside of here. That means we first get a stateful set and a service um, that is actually you know, uh, the composition that creates this virtual cluster. Because we have this stateful set, obviously that launches a container uh, that actually runs our control plane. Inside that virtual cluster, we now have this pod um, that has an API server and a controller manager, just like the real Kubernetes cluster, but both of them run inside a container. And we have a data store that is separate from the underlying cluster. That means the state is completely different from the underlying cluster. And then we have a so-called sinker, which is actually what makes the virtual cluster virtual because it doesn't have a real scheduler. That's the only difference between the virtual cluster and the underlying real EKS cluster. Um, the sinker uh, is very important because the virtual cluster doesn't need to be aware of the underlying cloud infrastructure. It doesn't need to know the nodes directly because it essentially just copies things down to the underlying cluster. And we're going to see how this works with an example. Let's say, um, oh, yeah, that's one thing I want to mention as well. Uh, vCluster is a certified Kubernetes distro. That means it behaves 100% like any other Kubernetes distribution. Whether you're using uh, GKE, EKS, vCluster, it's all behaving the same. A user won't be able to tell the difference what Kubernetes, ver uh, what Kubernetes distro they're running because they're all certified Kubernetes distributions. That means they fulfill certain standards that the CNCF sets out for you know, API servers, controller managers, et cetera, to fulfill. And vCluster fulfills all these compliance criteria. So let's take a look at an example. Again, we're talking to the virtual clusters API server and everything we're doing right now. 
Let's say we wanted to create a namespace. Well, we run the regular command, right? kubectl create namespace. Uh, a lot of people know that command. What happens is we're actually not creating that namespace in the underlying EKS cluster. We're creating it inside the virtual cluster. So running this command only writes an entry into our virtual cluster's data store, but not inside the underlying cluster. That means inside the virtual cluster, we now see this namespace. In the underlying cluster, we don't see it. We only see our host namespace as the only namespace in there. Now let's say we want to launch an application. That's where it gets more interesting. Let's say we want to launch this uh, Nginx. Um, so we create a um, deployment in Kubernetes, again, with kubectl. Pretty straightforward. We run this kubectl command here against the virtual cluster's API server. And then what happens is we write another entry in the data store of our virtual cluster. That means we have a deployment called Nginx now inside the virtual cluster. But again, in the underlying cluster, you won't see that. It only exists in that virtual cluster's you know, isolated data store. And because we have a controller manager in the virtual cluster, just like a regular Kubernetes cluster, and we defined the replica number two, now we're creating two pods from this you know, deployment, and we have two containers running our Nginx um, instance in, in here. So far, so good. But the question comes up, where do these workloads actually run? How do they get started, right? That's the interesting part about virtual clusters, because the virtual cluster, again, doesn't have a scheduler. It has a synker. And this synker down here essentially copies the resources down to the underlying cluster. That means in the underlying cluster, we now see the virtual clusters pod plus our two Nginx pods. And the EKS cluster or GKE or whatever you have is going to run these workloads, schedule these workloads, put them on, node, on nodes in your cluster, all of your admission control, networking, backups, logging, monitoring can now be centralized to this one cluster, although you have several logical virtual clusters running on top of it. All of the higher level abstracted resources like deployments, etc., are not visible in the underlying cluster. And that really lets everybody have their own Kubernetes version, their own Kubernetes distro. Every team can be independent. Um, that's essentially how a virtual cluster works. Of course, under the hood, it's a lot more complicated. I'm just outlining one quick case. Let's say we have two namespaces with two pods that have the same name. Obviously, that would be conflicting. We can't copy this NS2 namespace pod down to the cluster because there's already two pods that are called Nginx pod 1 and Nginx pod 2. So what the synker does under the hood is a lot more complicated than just copying. It translates things. And part of the translation is, for example, name resolution, renaming things to make sure they're always unique. They always can be you know, tied back to the original resources inside the virtual cluster, etc. So why is this a lot cheaper than creating real Kubernetes clusters? And it's really a lot, a lot cheaper, 40 to 70%. The reason why it's cheaper um, has there, there are a lot of you know, uh, ways that virtual clusters actually makes uh, running Kubernetes cheaper. The first thing is pretty obvious. We have fewer Kubernetes clusters, right? Fewer real Kubernetes clusters. We can have one EKS cluster, but 100 virtual clusters on top of it, but we only get charged for one by AWS, right? And you typically um, you know, pay several hundred dollars uh, a year per Kubernetes cluster that you spin up, with virtual clusters, because they run in a pod, you only have to pay for the pod, which is typically a lot cheaper. Um, so that obviously reduces the cost. The second reason why this is cheaper is um, you essentially have a common shared stack, as I mentioned earlier. Effectively, all of your containers run inside the same Kubernetes cluster, right? So you have one EKS cluster physically that has the VMs, but you have several logical clusters on top of it um, so you still have independent developers. You have a lot of autonomy for these teams. It feels like they get their own EKS cluster. But because we were using the same underlying cluster, we only need one monitoring, one networking, one backup, backup stack. You know, All of these essential platform resources are only required once instead of 100 times. That's obviously a lot cheaper to consolidate these things. Um, the third thing is we really enable sharing of clusters, and we isolate tenants inside these virtual clusters, but at the same time, we also enable sharing between tenants. So let's say you need a complex system like a Kafka, for example, right? Kafka message queue is really complex, hard to run, 
you can run it in one of your virtual clusters. And because all of the virtual clusters are running in the same underlying cluster, you can expose it to certain other teams and they can all share these resources, which is a lot more cost uh, efficient. And then these virtual clusters are very ephemeral, which is a huge advantage as well, because they can be spun up in seconds. Let's say you have a CI CD pipeline that needs to run tests, integration tests on Kubernetes. You can literally spin up for these you know, two minutes that your integration tests are running a separate virtual cluster for that at minimal cost versus having this huge idle cluster that's just waiting for CI uh, tests to start. Um, obviously a lot better when these clusters are ephemeral. Um, and you can pause them, which is a very interesting concept as well. Because virtual clusters are effectively pods, well, we can terminate that pod and restart it in seconds. That means we can store the state of a virtual cluster in a persistent volume, have the container restart. Um, and that way, you know, virtual clusters really become ephemeral clusters. So unlike an EKS cluster that you know, takes 30 minutes to spin up, is really treated like a pet, a virtual cluster spins up in seconds, can be paused, can be resumed, can be destroyed everything in a matter, matter of seconds. Um, so let's take a look at a simple you know, calculation. Let's say we have uh, just EKS without virtual cluster, and we want to give 300 engineers access to Kubernetes. We can now spin up 300 EKS clusters. Sure, we can do that with AWS. We can do that with, um, with Terraform or CloudFormation. Um, but let's see how, many, how much you actually pay for these 300 EKS clusters. First, in terms of annual cost, uh, you have to pay for 300 EKS clusters, and that comes at AWS's you know, regular uh, priced fee for uh, the managed service, which typically uh, is about $876 per, per virtual cluster. Multiply, multiplied by 300, we actually end up with $260,000 for these 300 clusters. That's a lot of money just for starting these EKS clusters. We haven't even run anything inside these clusters yet. Then on top of that, we have that platform stack, right? Monitoring, logging, backups, all of these things. Uh, and we have it 300 times. Let's say our you know, platform stack costs about $1,600. That would end up being a half a million dollars uh, to run 300 clusters. And then ultimately, we have the engineers' workloads. Um, you know, let's say 300 engineering teams, 300 different applications. Let's just estimate roughly they cost about $3,000 to run in terms of you know, CPU, memory, storage for these pods. Um, let's say that ends up with $900,000 um, in total. So if we sum this up, we actually end up with $1.6 million to run 300 EKS clusters for a year for our 300 different engineers or engineering teams. Um, now let's see how we can actually uh, decrease the cost by using virtual clusters. If we're using vCluster on top of EKS, again, we're not replacing EKS, we're just running one EKS cluster and then spin up 300 virtual clusters instead of inside of it, instead of having 300 separate EKS clusters. Let's see how much that would cost. Well, first of all, we have to run 300 virtual clusters. Virtual clusters are super lightweight because they run in a single pod. So that ends up costing you about $90 per year per virtual cluster. That means we have about $27,000 to run these virtual clusters. The second thing we need to run is that one EKS cluster that hosts these virtual clusters. And it adds up to be $876 because we just have a single one, right? Instead of 300, we just have one. You can already see the cost difference between $260,000 to run these EKS clusters versus running one, which is under $1,000. And then we have one shared platform stack. Of course, that platform stack is going to have to deal with a lot more containers, all these virtual clusters, so it's gonna be more expensive than a single platform stack in a single EKS cluster, but it's still gonna be consolidated and a lot cheaper than running 300 separate EKS clusters. So effectively, uh, we save on that end as well. And then we add up the, engineering's, uh, the engineer's workloads, and those are probably gonna be the same, because obviously the virtual cluster doesn't you know, make your application run any faster or any you know, leaner. Um, 
But if we add this all up, we actually just have under a million dollars of cost down from 1.6 million. That means we have about a 40% uh, uh, cost savings by adding vCluster as a new piece of software uh, to our EKS uh, platform. And that's really amazing. And what's even better about vCluster is it's open source, right? You can go on GitHub, uh, install it today, download it, use it, see the source code, create pull requests. Um, it supports a lot of different Kubernetes distros that can run on any certified Kubernetes um, distribution. And you can even do things like running EKS inside of EKS, running EKS on top of GKE. You know, you can mix and match uh, effectively the distributions. Um, so you have the same cloud platform, but have a, may have a different flavor of Kubernetes running inside of your uh, shared cluster. It's a really, really interesting concept. Um, our company has a commercial tool as well that's called Loft, which is effectively a control plane and management layer for these vClusters. Because, you know, obviously if you spin up 20 of them, it's relatively easy to maintain and manage them. If you spin up hundreds of them, or you want to create a self-service system for your engineer to spin up these virtual clusters on demand, or your CI pipelines should spin them up on demand, uh, that's a lot more challenging. Loft effectively helps you to scale up Kubernetes usage from you know, anywhere you know, 10 to 10,000 engineers um, by addressing things like access control to these clusters, tenant isolation between these virtual clusters. Um, obviously, it addresses things like cost savings, it enables you to create self-service of these virtual clusters and ultimately improves your engineer's uh, experience with Kubernetes because they spin up these clusters quickly, dispose them again, reset them again, pause them, resume them. Um, it gives the engineer so much autonomy and so much power um, that it really has a positive effect on velocity in a lot of engineering organizations. Um, again, the commercial product is called Loft, uh, but we have a ton of open source projects uh, including DevSpace, uh, which is the developer tool for Kubernetes, and vCluster, which um, is the tool that we talked about uh, today. So definitely check it out. Uh, it's on devspace.sh and vcluster.com. Um, again, when we're looking at uh, Loft and vCluster, uh, it's important to understand vCluster is uh, open source. You can spin up virtual clusters uh, yourself with vCluster with a nice CLI. Uh, it's a great experience. You can deploy it with kubectl apply or with Helm. Um, but when you want the management layer, when you care about how do we create a self-service experience for virtual clusters for non-privileged, non-admin users to spin up these virtual clusters, uh, Loft is a great way to do this. Um, and Loft also adds, you know, obviously enterprise deployment capabilities like high availability mode. Um, it integrates with your single sign-on, so whether that's Active Directory. Um, or LDAP, you know, whatever you're using, or you know, uh, SAML, um, any of these uh, single sign providers can be hooked in so you can securely authenticate with your virtual clusters. Um, and we have another cost saving feature in Loft as well that automatically pauses virtual clusters when they're not being used. And that saves a ton of money as well because you know, engineers actually need to sleep. Uh, there's a weekend, there may be long calls, and all throughout that time, you know, engineers don't need these, for these Kubernetes clusters. And because they're virtual clusters now, they're super lightweight, they can be paused and resumed. That's actually what the sleep mode feature does. And why does that save 70%? Well, just think about it. Let's say an engineer works 40 hours straight on Kubernetes, but a week has 168 hours, right? That's only 30% of the time. That means 70% of the time it's outside of work hours, you know, and that's not even including sick days, um, meetings, you know, all of these things come on top. Uh, but just by turning things off overnight and on the weekends, we save about 70% of cost on top of what virtual cluster would already save us. Um, and then obviously we provide enterprise support. We've been adopted by a wide range of companies, anywhere from, you know, unicorn startups all the way up to uh, large car manufacturers and uh, big tech companies. Um, and we found some really great supporters in the ecosystem, including Abby Kearns, uh, former CTO at Puppet, and uh, Darren, who is the former uh, co-founder and CTO at Rancher, uh, who are really rooting for us and really supporting our journey with vCluster.
Why is vCluster so popular? Well, uh, vCluster and Loft just makes it super easy for engineers to create that self-service experience or for companies to do that for their engineers. It's as easy as running a single CLI command to create a virtual cluster. Obviously, there is a CRD under the hood. You can also operate Loft entirely with kubectl. Um, and we have a UI that makes it even easier to see you know, which virtual clusters do I have, what is their state, et cetera. And um, if you're interested in either virtual clusters or Loft, uh, you, can come, you can find my uh, contact information here. There's my email, there's my Twitter. Uh, we have a Slack channel. Uh, there are over 700 users in there by now. Uh, we just started vCluster last year, and it already has uh, over 12 million uh, Docker pulls, so over 12 million virtual clusters created. If you want to learn more, uh, if you're interested in trying it out, find us on GitHub, uh, reach out via email. Uh, happy to chat more in detail. Thank you. Hey. Yeah, uh, if you want to sit here. If you want to sit there in the middle. Hello, Lucas. Hey. <laughs> Good meeting you again. Oh, I, I have to take my hat off for these your, your things. Or are we going to put these on or no? Yeah, well, let's, no, we'll let's just, leave them off. They're just for looks. <laughs> yeah, that I, way you I, can put a little sign in there that says press. I'm all, I'm all about just for looks. That's right, <laughs> that's right. So, so Lucas, tell us about yourself. And I'm here with Michael Cote for the VMware Explorer, at the VMware Explorer Hub. And this is where we get to do interviews with people like you. I've known Michael for a little while. We actually co-hosted a podcast at one point, so here we are again. So what, what do you want to know, Michael? Uh, well, I think, you know, it, it was fun seeing your presentation, and I think, notably, you spent a lot of time about how you drive down costs, which I think is, is great. And like, is that, like, especially as you're working on vCluster, is that like the primary thing y'all are going after, or is that just like one of five things that, that's great about it, or like, where did, would you call yourself a cost company or not? Like, what, uh, how does it fit into all of that? Yeah, I don't, I don't think we're necessarily a cost company. There are companies, you know, like uh, Spot or KubeCost, right, completely focused on cost optimization, recommendations right. for uh, reducing Kubernetes cost. I think cost is really important, obviously, to everybody. And vCluster enables cost savings. And obviously, right, right now, that's a hot topic, <laughs> you know, given the market situation. Yeah, and it's good to have a conversation about, right? Absolutely. Like it's, it's very concrete. Yeah, but I think virtual clusters has a lot more advantages than just cost savings. It's right. just one of the, you know, benefits you get out of it. I think one of the main benefits as well is that autonomy for the engineering teams. You know, handing out uh, individual Kubernetes clusters to everybody um, is completely unrealistic. And I mean, some companies have actually done it. Uh, you know, we met companies throughout last year that really created like 3,000 Kubernetes clusters. Right, right, You know, right. one for each person. Well, I think if there's something possible to do with Kubernetes, someone's done it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> a company, whether it's a good idea or not. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Well, we help them really like streamline these operations, make it a lot, you know, more straightforward. So, so talk about that some more about how um, like, like y'all's approach, or a, a vCluster v approach, getting a virtual cluster, mm -hmm. like, helps out for developers, what, you know, for their productivity, or whether it's kind of like doing the old blast radius thing. I mean, what is it, what are the benefits that a developer gets, and then maybe the benefits that, like, the operations people or the people running it get? Yeah, that's really good to divide it up in that uh, in yeah. those two categories, right? Because they're really, like, different personas with different needs. Yeah. I think the engineer really wants that autonomy and flexibility, right? They want to be in charge, right? right. They don't want to be limited by the security restrictions that IT imposes on them. Yeah. But of course, they are necessary because if you don't have these restrictions that IT puts in place, uh, you're exposing yourself to not just security vulnerabilities, but also to accidents, right? Accidents right. happen. People bring things down accidentally, and that's can be seamlessly uh, leading, I mean, that can le really lead to problems in the same way as an as a external hacker could. Um, so how do you make this work for both the engineer and then the manager is like, ooh, $600,000 in savings, I like that. Right. <laughs> then the developer is like, wow, like no performance hits on the, on, on the virtualization. What else do you got? Like, how do you make them both happy? Well, first of all, the developer probably wants part of that 600,000. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, yeah, that would be nice if that's yeah. how it yeah, worked. Yeah, that'd be good. Worked. Yeah, I think um, 
obviously that's a great uh, pitch in terms of cost savings that we use when we talk to the management layer. Right. right? That's that's what gets them to buy into our technology and then hopefully our you know enterprise support or commercial right. product on top of it. But we really are enabled through the engineers as well because the engineers. You know, we sometimes find in a way that the cluster finds its way into companies as shadow IT. Because you can, if you have access to Kubernetes cluster, but only limited access, you don't get your own cluster because it's mm. too expensive for your company, because they want to keep operations lean and make things, you know, uh, consolidated in one cluster. You may just get a slice of a Kubernetes cluster and you're very, very limited in what you can do. Right, right. If you have that access, you can already spin a virtual cluster today without your admins. Right. And grant yourself that access, right? It may be more limited to what you can do if your admin sets up vCluster for you, but vCluster is so lightweight that you, if you can spin up a container, you'll be able to spin up a vCluster and then talk to that vCluster and you feel like you're now exposed to everything else, right? You have a lot more um, control, you get your own cluster, but in reality, you're still locked into that shared cluster. So. Tell me about the technology architecture a little bit, because I'm very curious about the sinker in particular. I love that name, <laughs> the sinker. I mean, I think of fishing weights, but now you're talking about lightweight stuff. So tell us about that technology architecture in itself, and I'm particularly curious about the sinker. Yeah, I think the sinker is the core innovation in vCluster. Yeah. Um, there have been other approaches to make, you know, like Docker and Docker, Kubernetes and Kubernetes uh, a, a reality. But all of these technologies require you that you're somehow giving user direct access to some, you know, Docker socket or something very, very sensitive so that you can actually make this like Kubernetes and Kubernetes, Docker and Docker reality because uh, they want to just expose that interface and make it very, very easy for that virtualization layer to come through. With the Synchro, we have a different approach. We think exposing these things is a security risk. Uh, mm. Most companies won't allow you to do security, that. Security, uh, exposing what's a security risk? So, for example, to make uh, to make Docker available in a container, you typically okay. you need okay. to expose the underlying VMs, you know, Docker to the container inside, right? And that's really tricky. Systems like EKS don't even allow you to do that unless you patch their virtual machine images and things like that. So, for a lot of companies, that's not an option. It's a nice thing that you can do on your laptop or in your pet cluster. But it's not something that you can roll out in production to your 5,000 you know, engineers in, in a large company. Um, and that's why we invented the Synchro. Because the Synchro can run rootless without any elevated privileges. Again, like if you have you know, regular access to Kubernetes cluster without being admin, you can spin up that virtual cluster. And the reason for that is the Synchro. Because the Synchro just copies things. Right? Ah. That's all it does. And then obviously it you know, renames it and has a lot more complexities to actually make it work. But effectively, you know, the basic thing it does, it copies resources down and it copies the status of these resources up. The status is pretty important um, because you want to know what's going on with your containers, right? Let's say they're trying to pull an image and it doesn't work. You want to see the error. Let's say the containers crash and they fail. You want to see the error, of course. That means we, then, we can't just simply copy things. We also need to make sure that we trace them back and you know, synchronize back and forth constantly. So you know, how, how do you think in broadening it a little bit, right? So you all, you all have the, the, you're working on the vCluster stuff. Like, is there some point where like, that just becomes part of Kubernetes, or is that always a separate thing? Yeah. Like, like when you're thinking through it, when do you think of, like, like right now I'm looking, there's a Microsoft booth there, right? And, right. and like, they've decided <laughs> that Office doesn't ship with Windows. I mean, this is a poor yeah. analogy, but like, at some point, does it make sense to just make it part of Kubernetes or not? Like, where do you make a division between, like, a plug-in in the overall ecosystem and the core thing? Yeah. How, how do y'all think through that? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I actually know that the, you know, uh, OpenShift folks are really interested in that logical cluster concept, you know, similar right. to what we're doing with virtual cluster. And I think they are pushing a little bit for changing Kubernetes core, but it's incredibly hard to do. Yeah. I think you literally need to rewrite, you know, probably like 30% of the code base and Kubernetes is pretty huge and that would have some massive impacts on how it's been used potentially to uh, what the API exposes, there would literally be, um, you know, massive changes. And it could happen, but 
I don't see it happen anytime soon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it seems like I don't really know how to express it as I'll demonstrate with a lot of words here, but like it, it, it seems like there is some level of like basic functionality that y'all are definitely way above, <laughs> right? <laughs> and. You know, everyone always uses that big old C and CF landscape to like freak people out. Right. About, like, ooh, look at all this stuff. But it's almost a, you know, I've started to think about that chart as like, well, yeah, I mean, look at all this functionality and all these various things you have. But it is kind of an ongoing thing to, to solve for about like, when, when does this should just become part of the core or not? Right. Yeah. And um, I don't know, it's, it's kind of too new to figure out like exactly what that is, but hopefully it'll evolve organically. Yeah, I think one thing in Kubernetes in general that's very interesting and that's why the landscape is so, you know, blown up and crazy wild is because Kubernetes usually doesn't suck things in. Yeah. Instead it pushes things out. And I think yeah. that's a really smart strategy when you're thinking about, for example, storage. There's probably like 50 storage companies uh, with different specializations, right? Right. Where you could also say, well, a lot of their features could be core, right? They may be very useful to a broad audience, but Kubernetes doesn't try to suck all of that in because um, it effectively uh, would make it a lot slower. Because yeah, the that's very internet-y, like yeah. internet-y, like <laughs> and, and dumb also, at the core, smart at the edge. Also, you may not, yeah, I, mean, I mean, I don't know, to be a little judgmental, like you, you, won't, you won't get that sort of open stack thing where it becomes like too top heavy, right? Like, exactly. like it, might, it might be a good scheme for managing it that we allow the, the innovation new stuff to be out there so that it doesn't, drag is the wrong word, the metaphors break down here, but that it doesn't, it doesn't you don't get so many dependencies right. and other, other people with different priorities in there and things are a little uh, faster. If you kind of keep to those core, I don't know, I've lost track, but you know, I don't know, 10 or 15 concepts in like core Kubernetes and if you right. move beyond that, then uh, you're dragged around by a bunch of different things, perhaps right. in a good way. But, but, but it slows stuff down. Yeah, it definitely helps to keep up the velocity in Kubernetes to yeah. not you know, get so bloated. And um, I, you know, I was recently asked uh, if there were things uh, I would like to change in Kubernetes, uh, what they would be. And my answer was like, let's actually not change anything in Kubernetes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because we don't, you know, there's so many dependencies on Kubernetes and it's such a complex ecosystem. If you make changes like, for example, um, in I think like three versions back, uh, we actually had like uh, the networking group become stable and all mm -hmm. of these old better groups for ingresses uh, were discontinued. And I think that was a huge change, right? And that was just yeah. a single resource, right? Yeah. So I think, um, yeah, I think it's in terms of Kubernetes innovation, there will always be things to improve, but I would not you know, like to make any fundamental changes. Yeah, to yeah. So, I mean, it's, yeah. Been, it's been around long enough that it's not quite the time to like lock things down with backward compatibility. I don't know. I'm not right. like an engineer at, the, at a platformy layer, but it's getting pretty close to that, right? Where it's hard to get rid of. I mean, like you say, three different ways yeah. of doing networking to just get rid of that. That's pretty intense. That, that's <laughs> yeah. a sign of mainstream. Yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, that was that was one thing. I mean, I'm always interested in is like not so much the question of like is Kubernetes mainstream or any of that stuff because it's way past. It's, it, there's a yes there, but like. When you're thinking about like how how much momentum Kubernetes has, like I'm sure as a business you think about this a lot, <laughs> as far as like you know the total addressable market you're operating in and your slice of it and all that. But like, how do you how are you modeling that out? Like, what do you pay attention to to kind of feel like feel around what adoption in the Kubernetes market is? Yeah, I think for us uh, the huge game changer in the past, you know, maybe two, three years that has happened is uh, the willingness for companies to consider Kubernetes not just an ops-only topic. Mm, right. I can remember, I, you know, we launched DevSpace, which is a developer tool uh, for right. Kubernetes. Um, that was already in 2018. I can remember vividly giving a talk at a conference about DevSpace, you know, presenting it to the world, and people were looking at me like, nah, Kubernetes is not for developers, right? It's right. an operations topic. And uh, today, I don't think that's the feeling anymore. I think a lot of engineers have access to Kubernetes, whether they spin it up on their local laptop or whether their organization provisions uh, something in AWS. Um, a lot of engineers get access to Kubernetes or get access to Kubernetes through something like Argo CD. And I think that trend is going to continue and just accelerate what we're doing. So how did you think up this great idea for vCluster? 
what were the originations of that concept? Yeah, yeah that's actually a good question. So uh, we were running, um, a, you know, how it is in a startup, we pivoted. Uh, yeah. We were running a product at the time called DevSpace Cloud, right. uh, based on that open source project DevSpace we built. And DevSpace Cloud really was a namespace as a service. Yeah. So we were literally running multi-tenant Kubernetes. We were giving engineers these little slices of Kubernetes yeah. and hosting them you know, on GKE and EKS, et cetera. And that turned out to be A, incredibly challenging, and B, very, very limiting for the engineers. Okay. So we had so many problems because let's say you put a network policy in place. That means your network uh, is restricted to a single namespace. But now one of our customers wanted to have three namespaces and communicate with each other. We couldn't make that work, right? Because we had such strict lockdown for these namespaces. So we are thinking, how can we give them more power? How can we allow them to use CRDs to find their own network policies? All this like, you know, ah. very complicated stuff. How can we let them do that instead of forcing it on them and not having, you know, having it not uh, non-changeable? Um, mm -hmm. And then we saw a project by Darren Shepard, uh, oh. the CTO and yeah. co-founder of Rancher. K3s? Uh, K3V, actually. Ah. Yeah. Um, so after they launched K3S, and that became you know, wildly popular, yeah. uh, he had this thought experiment about putting K3S in a container. Ah. And he called it K3V, K3 Virtual. Oh, OK. That's what. That's what vCluster is based upon. Yeah, I mean, effectively, I mean, it's not based on not Darren's based on code. It, but you use it. Yeah, but we saw that thought, and we thought, that's great. You know, Darren had this little idea. He tried it out. Uh, wow. It was just like a weekend project. He worked on it for like two nice. days, and then never yeah. touched it again. And it was so interesting to see for us as a concept. And there were so many problems that didn't work, right? He went like 1% of the way. And we were like, what if we went the other 99%? Ah. And that's when we started playing around with our implementation, came up with this idea, you know, and uh, yeah, eventually tried it out in our commercial product, and that was great. Whenever I hear 99, I think of Get Smart. I mean, <laughs> 99, the old cast in the horoscope book trick. This, this, this is Alex's uh, rerun uh, <laughs> memories. <laughs> Absolutely, talking in your shoe. Yeah. What, so. Is it is it like a, a conceivable thing that, that you could do with vCluster to like run multiple versions of Kubernetes? Like, I mean, if, if you can kind of like virtualize Kubernetes, then you could sort of say like, eh, we don't want to upgrade this one at the moment, right. so we can like keep <laughs> running it, and yeah. which sounds terrifying and helpful. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is there isolation involved in that? Then? Yeah. No, yeah. for sure. So if you let's say you have an EKS cluster, you know, yeah. whatever version that may be. You can have a GKE cluster version 120 and another GKS cluster 119 running on top of this EKS cluster. Right, right. You can have a K3S cluster running there. You can have a K0S cluster. We support a lot of distros. Right. And all of the versions and configurations for that virtual cluster can be defined by the engineer. They can literally upgrade their own, you know, uh, without affecting the underlying cluster. The only thing that we actually require is that um, two things. The virtual cluster and the underlying cluster need to agree on two things. First, what is a pod? Uh -huh. So the definition yeah. of a pod needs to be the same. So if Kubernetes adds like an amazing new feature to pods, and you have an old version in the bottom, that's not going to work, right? Right, right, because you're still placing the pods and the containers exactly. in one version exactly. of Kubernetes. Exactly. So there needs to be, there's only so much your sync thing can do. Exactly, yeah, we <laughs> right, can't right. just inject features in Kubernetes yeah, on yeah, runtime. Yeah. That doesn't right. work. And the second thing is services to make a DNS-based yeah, yeah, work. Yeah. But those are two very, very fundamental Kubernetes constructs. Right, back to what we were saying earlier, like hopefully they slow down and don't Yeah, change. yeah. I don't think they're, they're changing uh, a lot. And yeah. if they do, you're only affected if you're actually using these features. If you're not, we're not going to sync that part, and then you're yeah. going to be fine. But if you explicitly want, for example, Kubernetes added uh, ephemeral containers, uh, yeah. as one example, to pods, which is actually a new feature on a pod. Um, I think it's a better feature right now. It's already stable. Um, but that would be a good use case. If your underlying cluster doesn't support that, you can still launch pods. You can still have a virtual cluster. But you won't be able to launch a pod with an ephemeral container. Right, right. That makes sense. OK. Well, I think we have time for one more question. 
and I'm going to ask it out. You go if, for if it. If that's okay. And uh, that, that is, um, so I've almost forgotten the question now. Uh -oh. This happens every now and then. Yes. Again. I was just so excited about it that I know it, uh, you are. It, it, it hacked my brain out. It, it was, it was uh, oh, I know, I know what it is. I just go. needed to babble before I could remember. So, uh, like, as you've been working with people out, out there, like, what is, you've come up with, with a couple of scenarios, right? The one, there's cost savings and then making it easier for developers. Like, wh what's something, like, completely unexpected that you've seen people do with, uh, with, with V Cluster and, you know, the management stack that you have? Where, yeah. where you know, <laughs> To use the word again, we are sort of like that seems cool, but maybe a really bad idea. <laughs> like something that like uh, is interesting and outlandish. I think the the first thing that we encountered was people started to nest virtual clusters. Right. So they created a virtual cluster. Now for is that a, team. a good idea? Oh, yeah. It's actually not a bad idea, um, but <laughs> we're not sure if it's a good one. In the we beginning, we didn't bad. think it. Uh, in the beginning, we weren't sure, but uh -huh. then we actually thought about it in more detail because the syncer copies things and then copies it again. Yeah, there's a little delay, but it's all asynchronously right, right, right. in Kubernetes, right? Um, so that's not a huge problem, but that's definitely something crazy we saw. And then the other thing is uh, we saw some people putting vCluster in production super, super early on. Oh, right, before you and, told them that was a good idea. Right, and obviously <laughs> yeah. technology matures over time. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. we're at a pretty ripe state right now. You know, 12 million virtual clusters have been created. That are live now in production? Yeah, there's a lot of virtual clusters now. Wow. But it's always the very early adopters. Yeah, I yeah, think a yeah. year ago where there was only like 500,000 virtual clusters, yeah. you know, I wasn't so sure if that made a lot of sense. And, yeah. and vCluster as an open source project, tell me, it, it, it's done, doing pretty well, isn't it? Yeah, people are really excited about it. Uh, you know, we have so many questions on our Slack channel, so many people from the outside starting to contribute. Um, it's amazing to see that, you know, motion. Great. Yeah, well, that's great. Well, thanks for uh, taking the time to talk with us. That was, that was fun to go over things. And, Thank uh, you. Thank you, Lucas. Enjoyed it. Awesome. All right, we'll see everyone next time. That's a wrap for today. Please come back tomorrow for more presentations and live podcasts.